Good evening, brothers and sisters. We are here again for the third and final installment of this Black Panther Party series we've been doing all month. Um, excuse me, in my absence, I haven't been a part of the series, but this, I'm glad to be part of this last one tonight. I, I think it's going to be a good one, and you're going to enjoy yourselves. Um, we're going to get to talk to some um, some exciting members of the, of the Black Panther Party. Uh, they have a, a story to tell that I think we all need to hear about something very important when it comes to political prisoners. Um, that are still here in this country and abroad. Um, let's uh, let's uh, little go over some house stuff and kind of get uh, acclimated to the lay of the land, some introductions, and then we'll get right into some questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Ike. Thanks, Brother Grant. So first off, again, welcome, everybody. We are happy that you are joining with us tonight. We know that uh, we started a little late, so we'll give we'll give our friends a chance to to uh, to jump in with us. Uh, as we do, uh, we want to encourage you to ask questions in the chat. We want to encourage you to react to what it is you're hearing, what you're seeing, because this experience is designed for you listening at home to be inspired to find ways to get active in the ongoing struggle, the ongoing fight to free um, all political prisoners, in particular. Uh, those members of the Black Panther Party still in prison. So if you have a question, we encourage you strongly to drop it into the chat so that we can get to it. We're really good at monitoring the chat and asking questions as they arise. 360 Collective is a, is a social commentary collective designed to confront issues of race, racial injustice. Um, and in that spirit, we, we believe strongly in doing knowledge together, building knowledge together. And so this is as much for you at home, if not more so than it is for us to find inspiration, motivation and ideas on how to become more active, more supportive and more engaged in the struggle to, to free all political prisoners and the ongoing struggle for liberation in, in America. So with that said, um, we have an esteemed panel with us tonight. We are honored um, by their presence and I have the, the distinct honor to introduce them to you now. Um, so with that in mind, I'm excited to introduce um, Yasmin Majid. She's uh, uh, here with us from uh, New York City. She's a veteran member um, from New York, hailing from the, the Corona Queens branch. Um, and she, she is highly experienced and devoted her life to freeing political prisoners um, across the country. And so um, we are honored to have her with us tonight. Welcome, Sister Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we have a, another esteemed uh, panelist with us. He is a veteran member of the Black Panther Party um, and also the chairperson of the National Jericho Movement and a former political prisoner himself. We will learn more about his experience um, a little bit later on uh, tonight. Uh, please welcome uh, Brother Jihad Abdul Mumit. Welcome, Brother Jihad. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome. Thank you, my dear brother. Alaikum salam. Um, next, we have uh, hailing also out of the Corona Queens branch in New York City of uh, the Black Panther Party. He is a he is also a veteran member of the party. Um, he is none other than, and he's been with us before, we're happy to have him back, Brother William B.J. Johnson. Welcome, Brother B.J. Right on, brother. All power to the people of free all political prisoners. All power to the people. And I also want to mention, B.J. will talk about this a little later um, in the program, but he is also um, a member of the Black Panther Commemoration Committee. And so you'll hear more about that and how you can support that work a little bit later. Uh, later on and i believe we will have okay hold it let me let me add something go ahead bj sister yasmin is also a member of the committee without her we can't count our finances she's our treasurer <laughs> okay all right my apologies sister yasmin is also a member <laughs> of the commemoration committee along with bj right on 
All right. So we we will um, we may have another member on the on the panel tonight. And so if he's able to join us and we will be be most honored by his presence as well. But with that said, as I mentioned before, we encourage um, questions. We encourage reactions. Please drop them in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat as Grant um, goes through the, the discussion with our with our panelists. So so drop those questions uh, now if you have them. We'll get to them as soon as we can. So, I, so but, uh, Grant, I think we're all right. Um, so this question, this first question, um, is for um, the sister Yasmin. Um, we want to, and, and this is something we want to be brief on, but I know people have been probably been watching this every week, but then you might have somebody on that has never uh, seen this broadcast before. That could be brand new to our platform and may not know anything about the Black Panther Party in general. So in just about 30 seconds, Yasmin, could you tell us what the Black Panther Party is? What does it stand for? Well, well, the Black Panther Party was a political organization that started in Oakland, California by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Sills, and it was called the Minister of, it was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And it was called the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense because they would go out in the community and follow the police around when someone was about to be arrested and uh, observed. So that's how the party started in 1966. And it grew across, it went across the country. Young people from all over the country got involved and there was chapters. I think it was like 48 chapters. And by 1969, there was approximately 5,000 to 6,000 young people that was involved in the Black Panther Party. And they started survival programs. And there was uh, a servant. There were servants of the people and leave that. And because they were servants of the people, um, they invest the government and it caused them to be attacked by the gun. Tw over 28 Panthers was killed and Panthers were incarcerated. Um, some of those people are still, some of our comrades are still in prison from those days. And I, before I really, before we really talk about the party, we need to talk about our political prisoners because while the government denies that there is, that political prisoners exist in this country, we in fact do have political prisoners. And right now there's eight Panthers that are still in prison. And I just like to call out their names so that we can bring them into this conversation. Uh, and we'll be able to, the comrades are here, we'll be able to speak about our comrades and so that you become more aware of them help us uh, support and bring them home. We have Ed Point who has been in since 19, he's been in prison for 52 years. We have Joseph Bowman, he's been in prison since 1971, 51 years. Sundiata Okoli, 1973, he went to prison. He's been in prison for 49 years and he's eight, four years old. Uh, we have Veronza Bowers, 1973, 49 years, and he was scheduled to come home over 16 years ago. Kenny Whit Whitmore, 1977, he's in Angola prison. He's been in prison for 45 years. We have Mumia Abu-Jamal, he's been in prison 1982, 40 years. We have Imam Jamil Alamin, he's been in prison since 2000, 22 years. And lastly, we have Kamal Siddiqui, who's been in prison since 2002, 20 years, on a case that was over 30 years and he was that he was convicted of. So these are our comrades, and we cannot forget them. And as Panthers, we always, always need to speak about our, our comrades because the political prisoners, they are the true vanguard. Right on. Thank you for that, Sister. Yeah, we definitely 
are going to get more into how you can support uh, these political prisoners as we get further in this conversation. Let's talk about um, going into basically how uh, these political prisoners, many many times, well, in all cases, um, were set up in the first place. So as we learned earlier this month, state and federal agents conspired to destroy the Black Panther Party. The COINTELPRO is the best example of this conspiracy. What was the result uh, of these efforts? I'm going to direct that question to Brother BJ. Okay, well, uh, J. Edgar Hoover decided that the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to internal security of America. And the whole idea was he wanted to he wanted to uh, stop the rise of a black messiah that would organize it, that would organize black people. You know, and before that they killed Malcolm because he was on that same level. But uh, the, the, the basic thing about COINTELPRO, it's a good situation, it's a situation that you can see the murder of Fred Hampton. The FBI was behind it, behind the scenes. They had an informant in the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. And this informant gave them the floor plans, the floor plans to where the Black Panthers resided. And they gave them the floor plan of exactly where Fred Hampton's bed was. <coughs> and the whole idea was to get rid of Fred Hampton because he was organizing a rainbow coalition. Jesse Jackson didn't start that. He just co-opted the name. And this Rainbow Coalition was the poor whites, Latinos, Mexicans. He was pulling together the gangs and some churches was gonna support Fred in his efforts to uh, uh, organize the community to get a better situation right there in Chicago. So the FBI gave the plans to the police agency and instructed them on what to do and how to do it. And when they killed Fred, the FBI backed off and like, oh, well, we didn't have nothing to do with that. And that's an issue of what COINTELPRO do. They were devious. For example, Geronimo Pratt spent 27 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. And it was the first case that Johnny Cochran lost. And it took Johnny Cochran 27 years to uh, exonerate Geronimo and get him released. And the reason why there was an informant in the defense team, which this did not come out until 27 years later. And because of that one informant planted by the FBI via COINTEMPRO, Geronimo was able to be released. In New York City, there were 21 Panthers arrested for a conspiracy to bomb the DA's house, the botanical gardens, and like, oh, oh, flowers didn't do nothing to us. Why would we do that? Department stores in New York City. And the ones that were actually in charge of that were undercover boss cops planted by the FBI into the Black Panther Party. And this was an attempt by, instead of killing Panthers in New York, they tried to destroy us illegally. And it took 18 months. And after the jury deliberated for 45 minutes, all charges were dropped. And this is what the uh, COINTELPRO was all about. Trumped up charges, inform, <coughs> divide, and conquer. Yeah, it definitely was a wicked system that still plays a role today. Um, I just call it different names, but it's still I would, the same. I, I would like to ask Brother Jihad to add. He has something he can add to that, too. Go ahead, brother. <coughs> Yes, uh, the uh, as uh, Comrade BJ, first of all, greetings again, everyone. 
um, and thank you for the opportunity to present. <clears throat> um, but just to add on to what Comrade BJ was saying, you know, the treacherous um, uh, aspects of the counterintelligence program, unique thing about that, well, the interesting thing about that, you know, it was proven to be illegal <clears throat> under the Frank Church uh, Committee. And guess what? Today is legal <clears throat> by any other name, of course. So now you had all the egregious or reprehensible things that was done to undermine black leadership um, in the community and targeting the Black Panther Party as number one public enemy. Uh, and so all those skullduggery and, 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 and wicked entrapment things that they used to do to us, including outright killing us, now it's pretty much it's legal. It's legal. I mean, they changed the name. It's a rap. They beguiled everybody. People kind of like, um, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. It's all part of our genocide. It's so systemic and historical. Kind of blends in with the uh, with the uh, with the nature of our oppression. But it's legal now. Counterintelligence program illegal. Nothing ever was done about that, and. And here we are today by any other name in numerous different programs and legalities of what the FBI can do in terms of our privacy, our entrapment, the length of our sentences, the continued oppression in our communities, and always on the radar looking out uh, for any Black leadership to rise his head, right. as they say, the Messiah, to make sure that that never happens. And as a result, sisters and brothers, it hasn't happened. You know, we're so discombobulated in a sense then this is a result of target efforts by the government to make sure you know that um, we don't gain our independence and our liberation so that's what i wanted to add to what our comrade bj said how it impacted us then as an organization as a, as a liberation organization and movement and how it actually impacts us today the more things change the more to remain the same right on so 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 let's let's stay let's stay on you, brother. Uh, I have a question specifically for you All pertaining right. to your imprisonment. Um, I understand you served 23 years in prison um before finally <clears throat> being released. I'm glad to have you in the flesh today. <clears throat> but how did that experience change or impact your life being locked away for 23 years? <clears throat> I um well, first of all, um I never regretted a day. Uh it's all part of the movement. I was on, had a good crew for the audience to know that I, I was captured on some bank expropriations and um, we went down in a ball of flames, so to speak. Uh, my other three comrades, the two of them have passed away. Um, and they were in the Black, we was in the Black Liberation Army. One is Lorraine Alexander. Uh, I lost contact with her over the passing of time. She just ended up doing a couple of years and I lost contact with her. But Eric Davis, Eric Stitchell Davis, um, and Elijah Wolf Abrams, they passed away all up, living up in Rochester, New York. But that's another story. Now, one from COVID and one from a heart attack. Um, but these are unsung warriors. And, and, you know, so we were really throwing down. So I'm proud of that. And for those who's not connected with the history over 50 years, uh, that when we were fighting for our freedom, you know, and that was not going to necessarily be accomplished financially by bake sales and and, and giveaways on the street corner. We we're fighting for our freedoms. And if somebody cannot relate to that, then I ask you to take out a history book and any picture that you see of Nat Turner, Sojourner Truth, Harry Tubman. When you look at them, do you see a criminal or do you see a revolutionary or hero or heroine? However you view them is how you view us. So I'll just leave it there on that point. But it changed my life, comrades. Um, I make a joke about it, say that, um, and this is totally a joke, but you know, because when you go to, when you are incarcerated like that, when you're in captive like that, it keeps the line of demarcation between you and your enemy very clear. Whereas on the street with the infusion of drugs and crack cocaine into our communities and just the, uh, the, um, the um, bedazzlement of capitalism and hanging the carrot out in front of you and people chasing it and all the TV and the media and how it kind of like uh, depoliticizes us so we can't necessarily always see the reality in prison. You do see the reality. And I make a joke, brother. <laughs> well, I said, if I didn't do all that time, I probably would have been some Uncle Tom congressman, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, who, Dad, who, oh, yeah, he's, the, he's that guy in you know, down in Virginia. Yeah, he hasn't done a single thing. Oatmeal man, as Gil Scott Heron said, you know, 
in politics for 40, 50 years and can't account for anything. But, you know, interesting enough, my comrade, I, I just want to answer your question briefly, like is that um, being in the Panther Party and going into prison and, and being with my comrades in prison and working out and training, which hopefully later on I can maybe share some stories with our comrade brother one that, that uh, comrade yes yes me mentioned was Kamal Siddiqui uh, was the first comrade I seen actually in the prison besides my own co-defendants. Uh, yeah, he gave me my shahad. He gave me the person that you know is Jihad Abdul Mumi. Well, that name came from. Kamal Siddiqui. I got some kind of some interesting stories to share about that if time permits. But I was energized when I was 16. You asked a 16 year old, what do you want to do in life? You know, sometimes uh, I don't know. You But I, I've always uh, was in a situation where from 16 on, I've always done for better or worse in terms of consequences, what I wanted to be. And that was a revolutionary. I wanted to be a revolutionary. So I got myself a bottle of Boone's Farm, a 357 Magnum, a fake briefcase. <laughs> and some weed and selling the paper papers <laughs> and talking that yin yang and serving them pancakes and the eggs and the free breakfast program. We built a, um, a, a health clinic from the ground up there outside of Plant. Uh, it was in the Amp Panther Party in Plainfield, New Jersey, with the Shanti Austin, some other comrades that y'all may know. And um, yeah, I've always done that, you know, for for whatever the consequences of, and I never waver from that. So I think being in a party made who I am today. Um, being in prison, you strengthened me, uh, gave me discipline. You know, the workout, the 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 regiment, the, the whole nine yards that came. So it really for the enemy it was a defeat for them. Like like Huey right. said, prison where is that victory? Right on. So you didn't decide to become. Uh, if you you know, obviously you didn't become a uh, some type of politician. <laughs> but you have, you, I understand you are the chairperson of the National Jericho Movement. So mm -hmm. just a question about that. What is the purpose of this movement and how did you become involved in it? Yes, it's, um, that was that that movement, that organization was called for and started by in 1998 by uh, recently. Well, I can't say recently released anymore, but uh, Jalil Muta King has been out now over a year uh, and, and Bubba Herman Ferguson and, and, and and comrade sister Safia Bukhar, both of them passed away. And there's a movement to support and campaign for the freedom of all freedom fighters. And when I was still in prison, so I was still, I did federal times. I was still in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary at the time when it started, they adopted me as a political prisoner. And uh, when I came home in 2000, sisters and brothers, I um, I couldn't associate with anybody while I was on, while I was on federal pro and they were really hawking me, particularly after 9-11. They were really hawked it up. My name is Jad. Thank you, Kamal, for that. And they was on me. Um, and even at my job, just shadowing me and stuff like that. So I, I did not come in contact with any comrades at, at all during the six years I was on parole. I got off in 2006 and then kind of like migrated my way into uh, the movement. I was asked to uh, be the interim chairperson of Jericho. And I was that uh, around 2009. And then after they have the elections with the organizational process, which I won't go into necessarily right now, but every two years you elect whoever you want to represent you in these positions. And I was uh, nominated and elected chairperson and I've served in that capacity. So what Jericho does real briefly, sisters and brothers, is that when we say campaign for the release of political prisons, it just kind of like it's, it's evolved in different ways over a period of time, you know, and this complexion and who's involved as things would go this is from 1998 to now. You know, we're talking about 24 years, um, but basically the mission hasn't changed. And so representing, I mean, some political prisoners we talk about today probably, and as you talked about in the previous program, have their own uh, support tight uh, defense committees. Right? Some do not. So those that do Jericho kind of position itself to be there to support in a humble way, financially, whatever we got to do. You know, those that do not, we try to push, be in the vanguard position, try to secure a lawyer, take care of their medical needs, get a third party medical intervention, um, uh, write letters, pay for families to visit. We visit. Um, if they're in the hole, we go there, you know, and then quite naturally targeted letters to pro boards and commutation, compassionate release, things of this nature. So it's really on the grounds, real active representation of, of our freedom fighters that's still in there. So as a chairperson, I kind of oversee that operation. We have chapters in various parts of the United States in Portland and 
uh, uh, Oregon and Los Angeles and Oakland and, and Boston and Rhode Island and uh, down South Atlanta, Richmond, Virginia, by the way, that's where I live now, Richmond, Virginia and New York City and Philadelphia. So we have chapters throughout and we try to be a, a real solid support to all those other beautiful, wonderful down to earth organizations and individuals that are supporting our freedom fighters. So we, we represent ourselves powerfully, but humbly at the same time. Well, it's truly a uh, a blessing to have you home all these years and have, mm -hmm. and have not re-entered the system like so many have probably thought you would. Yeah. Now, along the lines of that, um, we understand there are definitely political, political prisoners that are still in prison, which is why we're here tonight, but they also have, uh, let's focus our attention on some uh, incarcerated Panthers who have been since freed. Um, and Sister Yasmin, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, cur currently we have, um, originally we, we had over 20 Panthers. When we when I got involved, actually I got involved with Jericho. And <laughs> yeah. DJ, myself, and Bullwick, right. along with Sophia, and uh, creating um, the first, one of the first t-shirts for, for Jericho. That's right. It's created <laughs> by Brother Bull for That's the right. march that was in DC. And so and at, like I said, it was over still prison at that time. Now we're down to eight. Those that are free, we have um, um for one, Herman Wallace, one Angola three. He died four days after being that out of prison. And then you have, um, but before before him, there was Albert Noel Washington. Uh, he was part of the Queens, um, um, New York Three. And um, interesting because Jalil, the last Panther to have come, not he, Jalil is not the last Panther to come home, but Jalil, one of the Panthers that just came home, who really um, part of that New York three. So we've, see, we've seen two of the New York three Panthers come home in Herman, but unfortunately Noah died in prison in 2000 um, from liver cancer. That's what's been going on with those passed away. Um, they like uh, their elders, like any other elder, their bodies break down. It's even worse for them because they're in prison and because of medical neglect, we're losing them. That's one of the reasons still trying to get the eight that we still have in, in prison home. They don't deserve to be there. Uh, they've served, they have sentences that would allow them to come home, but they've been denied. They've been denied. But like I said, we have, we do have successes. We have uh, Herman. Herman Wallace, who was able to, his last breath was done on the outside and he knew he was free. Um, we have um, Eddie Conway, Sekou Odinga. We have um, Seth uh, Hayes, um, who came home and he died. He's uh, no longer on this planet, but he he was able to come home and, um, Am I missing somebody right now? I'm kind of, I'm, I'm reacting because I thought about Seth who came yeah. home, but we wasn't able to take care of Seth the way he needed to be taken care of. And unfortunately he died here. Um, he was the, because of medical neglect on the inside of the prison and he suffered. So by the time he was, when he came home, he was also isolated and he was also suffering. And this, these are some of the things that we need to get our comrades home. We need to make sure they're in safe spaces to surround them with the love and the determination we need to survive and be as, look as good as our comrade Jihad and is able to stay <laughs> because it's, it's strong. Um, last, last year, we, at the end of last year, we lost another soldier, um, 
comrade, um, Russell Maroon Schultz, but he was home. He was oh. able to come home. Um, but unfortunately, he um, he died um, because, and they knew he was dying. And that was the reason that they allowed him to come home. Um, but that was victory for us because we've had comrades that like Noah, I want to say like Noah, they knew he was dying and they wouldn't allow him to come home. We had Bashir Hamid, they knew Bashir was dying. They would not allow him to come home. So we know that this movement, we know with the support of the people that we can get them to make changes and allow our comrades right. to come home. You know, they're, they're our heroes. They are the Harriet Tubman's. They are the Nelson Mandela's to That's us. Right. And we need our people to recognize them and to know who they are and to know their names, to say their names and to be, and to also, like I said, make sure we get them home. And there's ways that we can do it because as Huey and them said, the power of people is stronger than the man technology. And with the evidence of our free political, our political prisoners that are no longer political prisoners is because of the struggle that the people on the outside have made and have worked to get them home. That's right. That's right. That's right. Let me add, let me add um, the Angola three. Uh, Robert King, who yes. I hope Isaac is trying to get him on because he's supposed to be on. But let me tell you this, the three brothers, the Angola three, they spent all their, most of their, all their time in solitary confinement. Now King, he spent 21 years of his 31 years in solitary. And he was the first one to be released. And when he re was released, he said, I am free of Angola, but Angola is not free of me. And he hit the ground running, organizing, uh, uh, networking with folks that were working to free the Angola Three. And then he also went all the way across the ocean and they made a movie about the Angola Three. Matter of fact, two of them. And we fought and we fought. And then Herman Wallace, was the first one he was able to walk into the prison and tell Herman, you're going home, brother, you're going home. Now, like you yeah, said, he had liver cancer. You see, it's medical neglect for all prisoners in the system, but it's more medical neglect for members of the Black Panther Party because they do not want Panthers to come out of jail. It's a vet still, after all these years, it's a vendetta against us. They rather us die in prison. Now, to give you a good example, Herman Wallace was told to be freed by a federal judge, and they refused to do it. So the federal judge called the DA and said, "Look, we don't release this man. I will hold your whole office in contempt." And that forced Herman Wallace to be home. And he passed away, what, three or four days later? But among his comrades and his friends. And this is why the fight and the struggle to free the rest of the Panthers is so important to us. It's in our heart because we want to let the system know, no, these Panthers will not die in prison. They'll die free. All power to the people. So that's powerful, BJ. And and uh Oh, I meant to say Wood Fox, he is out too. <laughs> he was the last one that King was able to go to Angola and say, Yo, man, you're coming home, brother. And he wrote a book about that. So and at that time, he was the longest held political prisoner, not only in America, in the world. Yeah, that's his book. In Sorry, isolation. Man. In solitary in isolation. confinement. That's right. Well, now I think Leonard Peltier has that distinction, unfortunately. But, 
Well, let's, 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 talk, let's talk a little bit more about that because that's kind of, you know, again, the real reason why we're here on tonight. We want to spend some time and give special um, – we want to recognize those political prisons that are still in prison today. Mm -hmm. um so let's 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 go let's get to know them as people in addition to their legal situation personal relationships you have with them tell about their family so on and so forth um so we really can kind of understand how important it is uh to to not only get them out of prison but to you know make sure their legacy is carried on once they get out um, but let's let's hear a little bit more about who these prisoners are. So, BJ, if you can help us out with that. Okay, I, I, I'd like to take the uh, first one, Ver Veronza Bowers. Now, he, he was uh, uh, given the uh, 30, it was a uh, uh, mandatory parole after 30 years. Now, this brother was on his way out the door, gave all this stuff away, his commissary, his clothes, and and as he was leaving, they rescinded it. The DA rescinded it. They went to court the second time. They said, okay, release him. <coughs> they rescinded it again. And he's been, let me pull it up. On that October 26, 2004, they the federal judge ruled a writ of habeas corpus, corpus, habeas corpus, and they ordered the parole commission to hold a hearing and release Miranda Barras on parole. Now that was in 2004. February 18, 2005, they also ordered him to release. And this could be found on his page. Then a third release. And then the Attorney General of the United States rescinded his release. So that means there's no reason for him to be there. He has his mandatory issue, mandatory parole. He's supposed to be in the streets. But because he was a member of the Black Panther Party. They will not release him. They have a vendetta against these old senior citizens. And if folks could go online and sign a petition or get involved, that's what we need. I think Jihad has an interesting story about Kamal Siddiqui, which we just celebrated his birthday. And we had a Zoom conference. I think it was something like 80 people online along with his children. And it was great. And the great part about it, he was on the telephone listening to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I will throw the ball to you now, Jihad. Okay, comrade. Yeah, thank you, BJ. Well, I think, um, yeah, I do want to talk a little bit about Comrade Kamal Siddiqui, but just to uplift the message here that um, as uh, Sister Yasmin and, 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 and Brother BJ have been saying, to mention their names, know who they are, learn who they are, find out who they are. Um, you know, interesting enough, like um, all of us are very young when we joined the Black Panther Party. I was just 16. You know, Mumia was 16. Jalil, a lot of us, 16 seemed like a golden age, you know, but maybe to join the Panther Party. But there was a lot of older comrades that was in their mid 20s. The mid 20s were still talking about very young individuals, young, young people. Matter of fact, I'm everybody. Huh? I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying so. And even other, or even our leaders, our, our the ones that we really looked up to, the Malcolms and, and both Malcolm X and, uh, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they both were assassinated when they were 39. So that means everything that they did before that, 38, 37, 36, 35, was done. They're young. Everybody's yeah. young. Now look at me, gray in my head and stuff like that. But um, so, yeah, when I went to prison, uh, same with Kamal, uh, he was there at some lonely, faraway place called Oxford, Wisconsin. 
and and uh, that was for long-term youthful offenders. I think I was 22 and I got there. He's 24. He's a couple of years older than me, maybe 25. He might have been. And um, and Kamal told me, I was so surprised to see a BLA brother there. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him sitting on the floor at Juma. I didn't, what are you sitting there all cross later? I said, what's going on here, brother? Man, talk to me. So it was kind of funny, but... um. But Kamal, like I said, he he uh, he schooled me. I was um, uh, I I used to be really hyped up individual um, as a as a young person, very energized and and too hyper probably. And when I went to prison, uh, you know, for those of us that was in the party, one of the campaigns we had was death to the pusher. So now I come into prison. And there's a lot of, you know, drug dealers there and stuff like that. And I'd be hearing them talking. I'd be challenging them straight up, kind of very aggressively in this closed-in environment. Like, because um, my, my thinking was all the time, two hurricanes can't blow at the same time. And you got a BLA brother come up in here with all that drug slinging stuff. Got to get, you got to put that to, to the wayside, you know. But Kamal taught me how to really modulate that, how to organize, um, how to interact with, because I didn't know, I'm just now coming to the, to prison, you know, and it was a lot to learn. And he taught me that real quick. And because of who he was, uh, that I was all listening and all ears there with uh, him. And I watched how Kamal, I think on that birthday call, I think his, um, I forget who said it, but uh, she was saying that um, how he's calm, cool, and collected, I think they said. Yeah, that's right. I, calm, cool, and collected. And with that smile, he had just reeling me back in, you know, and that had such a profound impact on how I conducted myself. Mm -hmm. And it took a little bit um, of time, a couple of years for that to really, to really sink in about how to deal with other brothers and sisters. You ever watched the movie Spook Who Sat By The Door when, yeah. when, when uh, Freeman was talk was talking to his comrades, he said, well, you get busted, you continue to organize in prison. And that's what we did in prison. You get busted, I mean, you got to shake it off a little bit and get in tune with your case, you know, try to uh, escape out of there if you could, which, by the way, that was the order of the day. That was no joking. You better not, be, when we were young, you better not be out there playing some baseball. You man, what? You joined the baseball team. <laughs> you joined the baseball team. You must be trying to position yourself to right field so you can get near the wall or something. I know you ain't playing some ball. <laughs> so, I mean, we kind of slowed down on that as we got older, admittedly. But uh, a salute, salute to uh, Maroon, Comrade Maroon. That's why we call Maroon. And we wasn't playing. Like, sometimes you want to, in, in the effort to get out, you we have to kind of dummy down what we're about. And you know how that is because we lost so much ground in our movement. And yeah, the quiet warrior, somebody put up there, Sister Catherine Morgan put up there, quiet warrior. She put it in the chat. But um, that's Kamal means. And so, but now we kind of dummy down. But I can tell you, when we were young, you know, the, the cadres of BLA, and when I, they sent me from, they, they whooped my behind for taking two pieces of fish. And Kamal told me just to chill out. But anyway. <laughs> when I say whip you, I mean they. I don't know how they took my coat off and all my clothes, and and we kept my handcuffs on. I couldn't figure that out, but um, <laughs> but they did that to me. They sent me to Lewisburg with more comrades there, and so we kind of thrived. We had cadre, we had PE classes, we worked out. Kamal was instrumental in all of that, and. Um, I learned how I ended up resolving so many. Matter of fact, that was one of the things that even came up in my last parole hearing, how many uh, institutional rifts and beefs that uh, brothers have with one. They didn't say brothers, but they say inmates have with one another, how we was able to resolve it, you know? And they it, that was like a checkbox in my favor. They didn't know <laughs> that what I was, how to resolve a beef. <laughs> they, they knew how I what I was saying because I, I would tell brother I said that's your enemy. It's a prison administration. So I, if they knew I was saying that, they wouldn't like that. No so doubt, that, your enemy play you. And I was able to, in different ways, depending on the situation, thanks to Comrade Kamal, be able to break that down and explain that to somebody in twenty five words or less. Because you got to get this explanation off really fast to stop somebody from stabbing each other or or hitting each somebody with a pipe or something of that nature. 
But yeah, so Kamal, now that he's he's been back in prison since 2002 on a, some old funky case. And I will say this, um, uh, comrades, real quick in closing my part on Brother Kamal, that um, we're realizing as time goes by, what really happened, if you ask yourself right now, what gets uh, a comrade out of prison is certain things that has to really, really happen. You know, one, number one, as Yasmin and BJ said, you know, we got to constantly keep the information out there, uplift their name so that their legacy is not forgotten. And so people become more involved, the energy of the people, all power, like said, the power of the people is greater than the man's technology. But, you know, we also have to make sure, and this is the real talk now that somebody's being down 50, 60, 70, well, not 70, not yet, years like Rochelle McGee, but um, they have to have lawyers because in spite of all the demonstrations and rallies, and meetings we can have generating the, the strength and energy around supporting a, a, a brother, you know, in prison or a sister too, if, this, this, if that be the case, then you still need at the end of that arrow, somebody to walk the information in, take it to where it has to go, bring the information directly out, walk it in, bring it out. You know, at the end of the tip of our arrow, and the arrow represents all the energy, all the mobilization, all the letters written, everything that we're doing, that tip of the arrow has to be a trusted lawyer to do their work and to make that happen, to take it into court, um, to pre present it to be in front of the parole board, to, to be able to file for that compassionate release, to actually put the pen to paper and walk it in and make sure it gets to the right place. So but all of the, uh, the eight uh, uh, Panthers in and for all the other political prisoners too, could, we're not talking about that necessarily right on the program, but there's many more other political prisoners in prison that, that Jericho represents and other organizations represent. Um, um, I heard BJ just mentioned Leonard Pelt here when he was talking. And so, but at the end of that, there has to be that lawyer. And that's money, sisters and brothers. There so you one thing that you can do besides putting it on your social media, just pick a prisoner, adopt a prisoner, send them commissary. If they have a lawyer, find out or if they have a legal defense team, find out where to send the money, you know, um, to help you. Them. So you have to pay for them lawyers. That's it. You got to pay for the lawyers. The days of people doing that on their own. And we have a lot of radical lawyers still, but everybody's getting older and their livelihood depends on it. It takes time away from the other things. I mean, this is just real talk. When it gets down to the real nuts and bolts, can we afford a lawyer to get Kamal or Veranza out of prison? And for some of us already have it, and it's not, and even with that, it's not easy. It's not like get a lawyer and get them out. No, we know yeah, right. the wall that we have to right. penetrate, but there has to be a tip to that arrow. You know, there has to be a tip. So everybody that's gotten out had that lawyer, that Dr. Maroon had Barbara Zella testify at that hearing. There has to be specific people in key places to have the right microphone at the right time to advocate and say and do and write the right things for them. So long live the spirit of Kamal Siddiqui. Um, I thank him for all that he's contributed to us. You know, after the call, um, uh, after his birthday thing, you know, Kasissa, his daughter called me, you know, right after the birthday call. He said, I got daddy on the phone. You know, we talked, <laughs> we talked about 90 minutes. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I have to admit a lot of that is, do you remember what happened to so-and-so? What happened to you remember? So, so then, then, then about finally got down to the business, you know, but, um, He's he has um, um, a lot of problems with this. He got ulcers in his feet, uh, in his ankle. Um, this okay. That, this just give me one more minute. He's in a place called Augusto Medical Center. Uh, it's in the Georgia, and it's a de de deplorable, despicable slave plantation. And he said slave plantation because he said that if you're walking down the hallway and the warden and and uh, the black lady who might be the assistant warden even a black woman, so it doesn't matter with the face on this thing. You know, other prisoners will, will step to the side and actually hold their head down. Oh, wow. And guess what he said? That's not a written policy. That's the culture. And everybody does it. Mm. And, and so that's so that's the type of place that he's in, you know, and, um, and, and you just either do it or you don't and suffer the consequences. That's one thing. The second thing is that it's already was nail for medical neglect now it's so oppressive there that a lot of the medical staff have left because of how the administration treated them 
you know, so now you got medical neglect on, on the baseline of it all. A lot of them have left and then even more have left because of COVID-19 policies and things of that nature. So he's, we really have to drum up that campaign. And I talked to Barbazello on his defense committee calls and, um, and we're going to have to really get a lawyer and third party intervention in there to save this brother's life before they chop off his leg or something. You know, so there, there you go with that. So he's, he's, he's going through a lot of medical, very painful with his leg and vasculitis is what he called it for those who may know. And that's, but there's a reason that that's happening. Uh, the diet, starch, carbs, if you have diabetes, you're done. If you have diabetes, you're done with the diet yes. thing. You're done because carbs and sugar, not just processed sugar, but it's, just, it's, it's not just candy sugar and white sugar in your Snicker bars and stuff like that. It's also the potatoes and the rice, the potatoes and the rice. So he's really under the gun, sisters and brothers. So we need to turn attention to him as well as Veranza and everybody else that's been mentioned. Thank you. Right on. All right. We have a couple. I want to jump to the comments. We got a couple of comments and in, in, uh, we want to get to real fast. Okay, so so first off, uh, Morgan Catherine asks, uh, how have you processed your revolution-related trauma, and how would you guide new activists on processing their trauma? And then there's another question from Queenie Queens, which is a general question about um, how can how can they help? She uh, well, Queenie Queens is from New York. So I believe that there's a question coming up about how listeners can get more engaged and activate around this important cause. I know that Brother Jihad mentioned a couple of things. So maybe we could take Morgan's question first and then we can jump more into the to Queenie Queen's uh, question uh, second. I have a quick one sentence answer to about the trauma piece is that um, if I may, PJ uh, and, and, and Yasmin. Yeah. Yeah, there's one, it's like, there's a book, I don't, I forget which, Wretched of Earth or Black Skin, White Man, I forget which book it was, uh, but he made a statement that um, as far as addressing our oppression, the trauma that it comes about, and in this particular case, we may be talking about coming out of prison or revolutionary trauma, just being involved in the movement, he says, actually, being in con your continued involvement in the movement may be the best therapy that you have, so let's, Look at that in 2022 and just take out the word uh, revolutionary for a minute. All right. You can and just, just break it down to another level as it is with activists today and things of that nature. All right. So uh, I'm a case manager, actually. It just ironically, I, I, my job here in Richmond is um, going into the prisons and jails doing HIV testing. And I started a program in Lewisburg with Matulu. Dr. Matulu Shakur and Tim Blunk and, and uh, Ricardo, Ricardo Jimenez of the FALN. And it was HIV AIDS awareness. I just did it to get out of prison, by the way. I wasn't caring at that time. But now I became aware of it and just so happened I got a job. And I had this job for 18 years. And actually, after doing 23 years in prison, I was going to the prisons and jails to do HIV testing and teach classes. And I tell uh, those, you know, try to get them to be in sisters because I go to a couple of uh, female institutions and when they come home to try to find some type of uh, involvement in developing their community as a therapy, you know, um, and even if you consider it like, quote unquote, giving back, because a person hit me with that one time in the interview, you, I see you work there, you're giving back. But I checked them on that. I said, no, I'm not giving back because I never took anything away. <laughs> so, giving cool. back you committed the crime against the people you might be giving back so that's all keeping it real but i said that this whole thing of helping that's one way another thing is we need our own we need our own uh new african we need our own black therapists in, in our communities so we can talk things out we do there's nothing wrong with sitting down with a psychiatrist or you know and, and we do have mental health issues the biggest problem in prison with violence with mental health people bipolar off their meds you know they stressed out personality disorder and schizophrenia and you put some you put put yourself in a cell with somebody that's bipolar off their meds they're already strung out and stressed out and already ignorant and apolitical you got yourself a potential problem as simple as that and and, and the same thing in our communities we need our own that's self-dependence and reliance so to answer the sister's question 
I think that number one and the general thing to just kind of stay involved in developing your community, if it's like working with a shelter or, or a women's group and teenage pregnancy or, or substance abuse or whatever it may be in, in, in mentoring and education, that's one good thing because you meet a lot of good people doing that type of work. Another thing is um, is um, go see a therapist. Hopefully it'd be a person who looks like you and knows the heck what they're talking about. There's nothing wrong with that. And be easy on yourself. With comrades, BJ been around longer than me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yasmin been around longer than me, actually. And you got to do those things to actually take care of yourself, too. Because right. sometimes we've been involved so long, it's easy to, <laughs> but maybe not anymore, but uh, not too long ago, it might have been easy to guilt trip us. You're not going to be at the meeting, brother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I want to see. I'm, I'm home watching a football game. I say, oh, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> make me feel bad. But you got to self care yourself, uh, Catherine. They were asking the question. Have your own agenda for your own taking care of your own beautiful self. I still got my Kamal Sadiqi workout. I still work out when I come home from work, like I'm on the four o'clock count or something. My family thinks I'm crazy, but it's real. But it's um, and do those things. You know, never wrong. Watch a movie or go walk. Relax. You have to take care of yourself because and then I will shut up because um, all of us, the BJs and the Yasmeens and all the other Panthers that might have been on the program and Albert Wood Foxes and, 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 and I mean, and the Robert Kings, we got gray in our hair. I would not ask. This might have been arrogant and stupid as hell. Pardon my language. But when I was 16, I wouldn't ask somebody 70 years old or anything. That's stupid. Maybe that's why I messed up so much. But the point I'm making is that it's on the young folks to get that stuff together. That's you don't know right. who the prison, the political prisons are. We had to go walk to a library to find out. Now you got this. That's we got right. to Google, Google it. Google who uh, Kamal Sadiqia. Uh, who is uh, Freddie Hilton, Kamal Sadiqi? Scary. You, you don't even have to walk to the library. So don't make yourself lazy by saying you don't know. Who are the political prisoners in Syria and the United States? Who are the black African political prisoners? And I'd be daggone, this device would even tell you that. This device would tell you that. It will. And there you go. So um, I, I'll shut up and let the other comrades. Um, do their part. But being involved and pacing yourself, talking to a professional, there's nothing wrong with talking to a psychiatrist. doesn't mean that you're crazy. And we may all need that. Right on. I know. All right. Well, so, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, um, <clears throat> my trauma, <clears throat> when I think about it, because uh, it could have been me. You know what I'm saying? I escaped them years in prison. I escaped death. So when it comes about trauma, I think about that. Mm. And then I said, well, shit, let me help get these brothers out because it could have been me. And I'm talking to you young people. You know, go back in your history, the slavery days, where they came from. Back in, uh, look up what happened in the uh, civil rights movement, Jim Crow, how they beat them kids with sticks and they put the dogs on them. It could have been you. But what I'm saying is, it's about us to get it together and do what we tried to do. We tried to change this system. Our whole thing was we want to alter or abolish this system. We didn't abolish it, but we sure as hell altered it. Some of you people on, online now that got free breakfast in school, when you was growing up, that was because of what the Black Panther Party did. That's right. Jay Edgar Hoover said, whoa, <laughs> that Black Panther Party pro breakfast program is getting the people to align themselves with the Panthers. We got to stop that because not only were we feeding the kids, we was given the true education, point five of the Black Panther Party program. We want the true education that teaches us the true nature of this decadent American society. And imagine this. 
kids from the breakfast program all across the country when the teacher said, well, so-and-so and so and this happened. And, nah, nah, that ain't the way it is. <laughs> no, no. And the teacher went to the principal, the principal went to the uh, superintendent, and the finally got to them powers that beat us. And nah, man, they teaching them kids the truth. So J. Edgar Hoover convinced the power at B to get free breakfast all across this American country. And when that happened, the attacks against the Black Panther Party intensified. So you want to deal with trauma? Educate yourself. Educate your history and see how we got here and how far we really got to go. Thank you very much. And thank you, brothers, for this forum. I really enjoy it. Thank you, Brother B. We want to uh, let, entertain this last question. This is really probably one of the most important questions in, uh, to Sissy to Yasmin. Um, basically, we're going to get some information on how people can get involved to support the uh, uh, the political prisoners in terms of key events, uh, the specific sites to visit, donations, things like that. So with everybody listening to pay close attention, get a pencil, paper, something to write down with, and take this information down. One place, well, one place that you can go to help support political prisoners is the, the National Alumni Association of Black Panther Party. Um, we're a 501c3 organization and of our mission is to help um, support political prisoners. So there you could go and give a donation. And like Jihad said, there is um, the lawyer fees. But I also want to remind you that no amount is too small to contribute to the support of political prisoners. Um, you can also go the main place to go to find out who our political prisoners are because they do identify them is the Jericho movement. And you will be able to um, find out and write to political prisoners. That's the one of the main things. You should write to them, communicate with them. Possible if you live in the area, you could visit them. And so you could get an up close and personal look at who they are. So that too could help. Um, each a number of the political prisoners have um, support groups, like Sundiata Okoli right now. His group is called um, is Bring Sunny uh, Sunny uh, Sundiata Okoli Home. So if you look up that, you'll see this, his campaign, and then you have Free Kamal Siddiqui. Go on the website, and you'll see Free Kamal Siddiqui. And as Jihad said. There's a number of places that you can go and it's right on, it shows you all of the different fundraising groups. But I, at this point, I wanted to give an update. I wanted to give you an update on one of the political prisons. I, we got a letter um, just the other day from Kenny Zulu Whitmore. He, he just wrote me to tell me that his case has come before um, he's working on getting released. He's also a part of the Angola. He's also in Angola prison and was actually recruited into the Black Panther Party by the Angola Three Brothers. That's Kenny Zulu Whitmore. And, and he's been there. And one of the reasons he hasn't come home because he's still a Panther. Like he said, once a Panther, always a Panther. And, and that's how he acts. He acts as the, he still acts in the spirit of the Panthers. And on September 17th, 2021, um, the DA and um, Docs met to um, decide on a parole date for, for Zulu. And it, it was supposed to happen in 30 days and they rescinded it. So now he has back in court. So Zulu needs support with his lawyers because again, it costs money to go in court. Um, and just recently, Sundiata was, is in court. So there's, and, 
and also the Ronza. So a number of our comrades are in court trying to get uh, reduced sentences and to be released because they have been in prison for 40 and 50 years. And I just wanted to also bring up um, our comrades. I, when we was talking about those that are free, I, I was I became overwhelmed. But I I want to give you the names of our comrades who have come home, and it was Herman Wallace who came home in 2013, Marshall Eddie Conway he came home in 2014, Sekou Odinga came home in 2014, Albert Wood Fox 2016. Herman Wallace, 2018, Robert Seth Hayes, 2018, and, Jam and Jalil Mustakin, 2000, 2020, and Russell Maroon Schultz came home in 2020. Those are our Panthers that were freed. Our Panthers that have joined, joined the ancestors while they were in prison was Kwasi Balagoon in 1986, Albert Noah Washington in 2000, Teddy Jahi in 2001, Warren Wells in 2001, Bashir Hamid in 2008, Mondo Lunga in 2000, um, 2016, and Abdullah Majid 2016, and last, was Chip Fitzgerald. He was at that point one of the longest held political prisoners. He had already been in prison for uh, over 50 years and he, he died in 2020. So again, I just want you to know that these brothers need to come home and their elders, their grandfathers, um, and they need to be home with their families, those that we can get home. So we have eight eight that we need to fight for, we need to get them home. And there is um, uh, um, Chairman, um, Representative Bobby Rush has, um, a, a, he is involved in the COINTEL Disclosure Act. And please look it up, it's, the act is, is HR 299A is COINTEL Full Disclosure Act. We need people to support that and let Congress know about the act of um, for to open up the COINTEL Pro and be reminded that out of all, all of our brothers that have gone to prison, not one person in the United States, although the, the, they've killed our people, Nobody has gone to jail for or has spent any length of time in prison during the time that we was at war. And we was in a war during That's the time right. of the Black Panther Party. That's right. And we have to be mindful of that. We, we went to jail, but they, and was treated as criminals when in fact we were political prisoners. That's right. And if, please look up to be a political prisoner and you'll know that these comrades went to prison because of their political beliefs. And when some of them are charges, but right now the comrades that are still in prison are in prison because of the killed some um, charge with killing police officers. So please be mindful of that, but not one policeman has ever went to prison for killing us. Right on. Yeah, we appreciate that information. It's, uh, hopefully everybody's gotten that information down so they can uh, get involved. Um, this is not. A, this is this is something on my mind, and somebody might be actually wondering this. Um, who's listening right now? <clears throat> In terms of I, I, this, might have came up before as a question. Someone might be wondering uh, why a president can't either rescind or pardon of uh, these political prisoners sentences if anybody can explain that is is, is that the case um or they're not allowed to get involved in these cases um can, i guess yeah. i know jihad 
could I could start with go on. The presidents have a can pardon and give clemency, and they have in past. Some presidents have, they can, um, but they have to have they have to be on the federal level for the president in order for the president to um, to pardon or give clemency to someone. And on a state level, governors can do it, and they some of them have done it. But as far as Panthers are concerned, we're talking about Black Panthers. As far as Black Panthers are concerned, there have never been pardon. There's no clemency and no compassionate release for any Black Panther. But the, but they have the ability to do it. John. <laughs> Well, yeah, you uh, you said it all, uh, comrade. You said it all. This for well, federal. Uh, you asked about the, you know, a president deals with uh, federal uh, prisoners, such as myself was in the federal system. Uh, for states, it would be the governor that would be able to do it, and and oftentimes the the go to, if it was to happen, would be clemency, meaning that you reduce the sentence to the point where you can go to the pro board and get out. Pardons very seldom happen at all. If they do, they usually happen once you're out, like myself, and been out for a while, then you can ask for a pardon. 99% of the pardons granted state and federal people that have been out. As a matter of fact, I'll be filing one this year because I've been home uh, 22 years for what it's worth. Um, but um, uh, so, yeah, it's just like Sister Yaz said, it's Panthers. <laughs> Was the we was in public enemy number one, and 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 we I might this is totally subjective. It might be, um, you know, when you look at the FALN comrades um, um, that were pardoned under Bill Clinton, and Oscar Lopez Rivera was pardoned by uh, President Barack Obama the day before he left office. Um, the Puerto Rican comrades, you know. Um, they they there's more there's more politics that and leverage there as a colonized even though they're colonized as a unified nation to levy level against the government for whatever they're jockeying for and doing like that um we here in the diaspora we haven't developed that punch of unity uh to to be able to to leverage anything so somebody said we gotta be like the puerto rican brothers and sisters. well let, let's let's look at that then when you're in from another land, I mean, it's just like this here. And then I said, it's like, and I know I'm getting off the question a little bit, but um, in prison, black people that go to the West Coast in the federal system, we're really united because we're away from the, we're off the East Coast. We out there in California, Midwest, man, we got these Aryan Brotherhood and the skinheads out there, we tight like this. I don't care where you're from, New York, Jersey, you know, anywhere on the coast like that, you know, we're together. You bring us back to the East Coast, and we may not be together. Now, what neighborhood are you from, Joe? You know what I mean? You know, it's so, but and so, if that may kind of like um, too broad of a brush, but a lot of times when you can identify with the land and still hold that affinity to it, they're in a land that they can still maintain that kind of identity. We're in the place where we kind of lost in the sauce, where we cannot, we cannot weld that leverage yet. And I say yet, because one day I believe we will. All right. Thank you for that. Just uh, mm -hmm. was on my mind. I know maybe some of us might have been wondering the same thing, especially when Barack Obama uh, had some of the most, I think he might have had the most uh, <clears throat> pardoned, commuted, and rescinded of convict, convicted uh, felons of 1,927 people. But uh, Anyway, but, let, before we close out, I think my, in that no, that's applaudable. I just want to say that, that's applaudable, but it wasn't us, and it was it, it, just, yeah. it wasn't us. It, it just ignoring our didn't have to do with black folks in resistance. It didn't have anything right. to do with us. And if if yeah, if that's, Obama that's was truly in to have put, he should have freed Leonard Leonard Peltz here, exactly. and he didn't exactly. So please, please, someone look at what Leonard Peltier and Barack Shem, out of all of the federal, I'm not saying he yeah. shouldn't have freed some of us, 
but out of all right. of the political prisoners in the federal system, Leonard should have been freed. Wow. Well, we hope we hope after tonight that uh, some movement will be made. We hope that we've actually done. We know we've done something great tonight, but actually, have, we hope that we've we've um, gave a knee jerk reaction to people to to be able to to, to move on this and actually get involved. And to feel compelled, uh, not just being only compassionate and being caring and kind, but actually, you know, this is the right thing to do. This is just this is just the right thing to do to get these these brothers home. Um, Isaac, I know you might have something before we wrap it up. If you want to come back on and give some some remarks, sure. So I guess we'll give our panel the last word before we close out. But um, we've heard we've heard some important ideas tonight and opportunities for listeners to get involved. Um, anything from making a, a cash donation to the NAA BPP or directly to the Jericho movement to writing a letter and adopting a political prisoner, beginning a relationship with them um, through, through writing or in some cases, even emailing. Uh, and then as, as uh, sister Yasmin said, even visiting with a political prisoner who may be near, where, where you live. And then there are more things that you can do beyond that. You can get directly involved with the Jericho movement. You can activate, get involved with um, Brother Jihad, who's here tonight, contacting him, um, talking to others in your community about political prisoners, organizing letter writing campaigns. Sister Yasmin also mentioned HR 1298, which is a bill that is sitting in a committee right now in Congress. You can contact your congressperson and ask them to move that bill onto the floor for a vote. There are only, I believe, 24 or 25 uh, sponsors or co-sponsors on that bill right now. That is a bill that uh, can get and should get and needs to get moved onto the uh, Congress floor for a vote. This is, this is a, an important bill because it will open up records that are still sealed related to COINTELPRO and the systematic, um, the systematic attempts to destroy the Black Panther Party. And it will also remove J. Edgar Hoover's name from the Federal Bureau of Investigations building, among other things. So that's a bill that we hope that you will activate around, support, um, contact your Congress people. Um, so those are just a few of the ideas that we've heard tonight. Um, before we get into our program for next week, I want to make sure that there's nothing that we missed. Is there anything, anything else that um, our panel suggests that listeners can do to activate to help and, and to support the cause of um, freeing all political prisoners, in particular, the eight members of the Black Panther Party who are still in prison. Is there anything that we've missed or any anything that you want to close out with? Uh, uh, Ike, if I may, um, I just yes. want to emphasize again, oh, on top of the emphasis, you know, writing a, writing a, a freedom fighter is, 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 is real live action. It's, it's, it's more dynamic than reading a book. You know, chronologically speaking, we'll be dead anyway soon. Um, and I'm one of the younger ones. And then, you know, when you, you look at us, um, this we're going to clock out soon. So you won't have somebody on the show that's in the Panther Party. You'll be, you, you will be forced then to read it from a book. So yeah. while you while you have Freedom Fighters alive, and you don't have to write a political heavy duty letter. You say, look, uh, you know, I go to school. I, I live in and Arkansas, whatever, you know, I'm having, I'm raising my son, what do you think I should do? You know, and, and we would love, I mean, they would, they would weigh in with such beautiful ideas. And, and, and on top of that, you, you, would, you would help them so much with their spirit. And, right. and right. you would let the prison administration know that these comrades are not alone, that people are all around the world love them, know what's happening with them, care what's happening with them. And that means a lot or guard to know that somebody's getting, you know, a dozen or so letters, you know, every day. That's a big deal. They just can't isolate you and do what they want. It'll be harder for them to do that and get away with it. So it has a lot of ramifications you're writing somebody. So go on and write, adopt anybody and just write it. You don't have to That's right. you know, put your guts, just, just be yourself and just write a simple letter. I'd like, I'd like to piggyback on what he said about writing because, uh, Every year, the Black Panther Party Commemoration Committee of New York, we have a what you call a 
Black Panther Party Film Festival every year in October. And at the end of the film festival, we say the same thing, write a political prisoner. This sister from, came back one year and she said, look, I wrote so-and-so and he told me to do this, he told me to do that, and wow. She said, I'm getting letters from him all the time. And if you write them, they'll instruct you with what to do and how to do it. And if you missed anything tonight, as far as how to contact them, email me, bj710nyc at gmail.com, bj710nyc at gmail.com. And whatever you missed, you just let me know and I'll shoot it right to you. And Brother Jihad, I'd like to say something the way you pulled up that phone, man. And, um, and this computer stuff, if we had that back then, man, I think we'd still be around as an organization, huh? We might. That's right. <laughs> I don't even know how we did it back in the day. If we posted a meeting there in Times Square, you got thousands of people in the street. You got to find the phone booth. But with me, I don't even I don't even know how we did it. <laughs> Mimeograph machine. I bet you some of these youngsters don't even know what that is. <laughs> Jihad, we were so jihad, we were so high on the people that we could do anything. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> right on, That's right. And, and we did it. That's right. No we doubt. sure did. It's that Panther newspaper, that 25 cent Panther newspaper. That's right. That's how we did it. That's right. All right, so um, so Grant, just one one last thing. I know that you're going to close. I just want to call attention real fast to our next program. This is happening next week at eight o'clock Eastern time. Our program is called Activating for Reparations. Um, we have a special guest, and we have more on the way who are in the process of confirming with us. But right now, we have uh, Deidre Farmer Paleman. She's the executive director of the Restitution Study Group. She has a wealth of knowledge around the issue and cause of reparations. She'll be joining us next week to be to give us all ideas about how we can activate around the cause of reparations, not only nationally, but in our own communities uh, as well. So we hope that if you enjoyed this program, that you come back next week and uh, do the knowledge with us as we as we activate for reparations next week, Thursday, March 3rd at eight o'clock Eastern time. I don't know. All right, definitely want to come back for that. But let me just let me just uh, say as we close out, um, thank all the the comrades who came on the show on our program for the last few weeks uh, celebrating Black History. A lot of times, the, the Black Panthers get left out of Black all History. The time. They have definitely a huge part of our history. And uh, we're we're happy and we're excited. We were just we feel honored actually to be a part um, of this celebration uh, with you all these last few weeks. Um, it's something that we will definitely hold near and dear for the rest of our lives. So thank you all for taking all the time you had to come out and talk to us and right setting on. time and time to to talk about these um, important issues, especially tonight. Um, we're talking about freeing um, the political prisoners that are the eight that are still locked up after so many decades um, behind bars. So we hope that we have influenced someone tonight. We hope that we have um, inspired someone tonight. That's right. Um, so That's right. this concludes um, this series. Uh, we'll be back next week on another topic and we'll be looking forward to seeing you all next week. So uh, brothers and sisters, thank you. Thanks again and everyone else. Um, all powers to the people, real power to the people. Free the land, power to the people. Thank you, Brother G. Thank you, Brother I. to the people. Uh, thank you, all. All right, thank you very you. much for what you guys do, man. Free all political prisoners. Free them all. Free them all. Great.